Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar, the second webinar of uh, European Young Myeloma Patient Group, powered by MPE. And we have today a very interesting topic, which is nutrition. Before we are getting there, allow me to spend a couple of minutes to uh, give you an idea on the uh, agenda of the next uh, 60 minutes that will be spent together. Um, you will firstly have to uh, listen to me for the uh, five about five minutes. And afterwards, I will give the word to our speaker, to our special guest today, um, who will uh, give you an idea on the importance of having a good nutrition for us, for the youngest myeloma patient. Um, the speaker today will be Ines Almada Correa from Portugal, and she is a nutritionist specializing in oncology and autoimmunity. Um, at the very end of the presentation of Ines, we'll have uh, the question and answers. I will come back uh, a little bit later on uh, on how you can uh, ask your questions, and we will be closing around uh, uh, five uh, five o'clock. Central European time. Um, allow me to give you a couple of uh, rules during uh, this uh, webinar, uh, housekeeping instructions. You will be able to hear uh, and to see the presenters, but you won't be able to uh, hear the other attendees during this uh, webinar. Um, for the questions that you may have, uh, and please ask your questions, you have the possibility to do that at the very bottom of your screen with the Q&A uh, button, and you can uh, post your question there. Shouldn't you have, or shouldn't you want to give your name? You can uh, do it uh, anonymously uh, as well. So that's for the question and answers. Um, on the other hand, you have also the possibility to have a chat with us or at a very, to a very particular person. So you can choose to have the chat with everyone and or to have a chat with one uh, person in particular in our uh, webinar. But again, please, for the questions, use the question and uh, answers. Should you have any trouble uh, with video or audio, please put it on the chat and someone from MP will uh, join you to uh, help you uh, there. Um, this webinar will be recorded, so you will be uh, the possibility to uh, review uh, this um, this uh, webinar afterwards, and it allows me to remind you, uh, shouldn't you have been there uh, for the first webinar we had a couple of uh, weeks ago, go to our uh, site and have a review on the very uh, first webinar we had uh, a time ago. Um, very quickly, for the people who shouldn't have been there before, um, EYMPG, who we are, or who, uh, what do we want to do and to uh, to have as a aim, as a goal? Um, we want to um, meet the, the, the needs specifically for the young uh, myeloma patients in terms of work, in terms of sports, today in terms of nutrition, very specifically. How does it work? Um, the group, We'll host a quarterly uh, webinar, just like we have today, and the topic will be chosen by you. So we will uh, post a poll uh, in the next few weeks, and you will be able to choose uh, for the most important topic that you want us to tackle. And we will find a specialist um, to give you uh, an ID and to give you a webinar around the topic that you've uh, you've chosen. So this group um, is. Um, mainly for the patients under 55 uh, years and uh, patients uh, of uh, myeloma, of course. That's um, what, what we're and what we aim for. So today, we will have um, Ines Almada Correa as a speaker. Um, she is a clinical nutritionist specializing in oncology and autoimmunity, so just what we wanted to uh, to have with uh, with us, and it's a very uh, very uh, big pleasure and honor to have Ines with the, uh, with us today. She holds a postgraduate degree in nutrition, and afterwards she had a master in biochemistry and biomedicine. And as we speak, 
She is pursuing a PhD in dedicating integrating the latest scientific research to help people like we, to help um, um, the, the, the cancer patients and the mil, uh, myeloma patients um, and, and to improve the quality of life. So um, again, very, very big pleasure and honor to have you uh, Ines with us. Thank you and the floor is yours. So I was thanking you for the, the introduction and for the invitation to be here with you. So I've structured um, my presentation having into consideration some of your uh, some of the questions you've you've sent, but I really thought of it more like a conversation. So if you have any further questions, please please feel free to to ask them. So, yeah. So I will start by saying that contrary to what happens with um, several other oncologic diseases. For multiple myeloma, the only lifestyle factor associated with an increased risk um, that has been identified is obesity. And when we think of obesity, we frequently think of high body mass index or high weight, but actually what we should be thinking about is high adiposity, so high percentage of fat mass. And why am I saying this? Because we can have two different persons one have uh, is an athlete and the other one is a really sedentary person that spends long hours at the computer, uh, orders all the groceries uh, online uh, and get them delivered uh, at home, uh, goes to work by car. And when we are going to assess the um, percentage of fat mass of, of these two different persons that have the same weight, we will have uh, uh, and decreased fat mass for the athlete comparing with the sedentary person. And really what matters uh, when we talk about risk is a high um, percentage of fat mass, so high adiposity. Um, and one more thing is that it's important to think of this like a risk factor, but it's also important to think of it like uh, an important factor to have into account after the diagnosis. So talking about the nutritional status, um, it reflects a balance between the intake of nutrients and the capacity of the body to use these nutrients. And frequently, myeloma patients have um, an alteration in the nutritional status that is both associated with the disease, but also with the treatments. And for this reason, it's really important to have nutritional support uh, since the diagnosis because it's um, very, very well known that will improve the nutritional status of the patients and with this improve immune function, quality of life and ultimately survival. And when we think of nutritional status and uh, improving nutritional status, we we should be thinking of having and searching for a nutritionist or a dietitian, uh, depending on the country you're at, the names may, dif may differ, but um, you should ask these professionals to help you uh, manage all the, the situations you are, we are going to, to talk about further. So um, this, it's really important to have a nutritionist or a dietitian integrated in um, your multidisciplinary care teams. And um, this is important because as a nutritionist, we have um, a goal uh, when we think of nutritional support to maintain and improve the food intake that is frequently changed uh, after the diagnosis, maintain the skeletal muscle mass and the physical performance that are really important for you to maintain your autonomy, to do your daily tasks, to have vitality. Um, it's also important to reduce the risk of having to uh, decrease or interrupt the scheduled treatments and also will have an impact um, in improving quality of life and survival. One other dimension in which uh, nutritionist intervenes in, is in the management of complications um, that are associated with multiple myeloma. And these are some of the most frequent complications, um, anemia, renal dysfunction, decrease in bone density, changes in immunity, but also hyperglycemia, for example, if you're taking uh, corticoids. 
And to minimize the impact of these manifestations, we can have, uh, we can think of some uh, dietary strategies. So for example, for anemia, and it's important to highlight that anemia in multiple myeloma is not due to a decreased intake of iron, uh, dietary iron. It's uh, due to, um, it's a consequence of the disease, but we can, um, give uh, what the body needs uh, and improve the iron intake for the body to have the nutrients uh, it needs for um, to perform its functions. So thinking of anemia, we can increase the intake of iron-rich foods such as legumes, <clears throat> green leaf uh, vegetables, uh, meat and nuts. Uh, if you're taking calcium supplements, um, you should take them before or after the meals because they can interfere with the iron absorption. And um, for renal dysfunction, for example, we should decrease the intake of salt and um, you can flavor your meals uh, using herbs, for example, or spices. Um, you can also, it's really important to keep hydrated um, and to maintain a diversified diet. Um, adequate protein intake is also uh, really important. It may be needed depending on your renal function to um, adapt the, um, the intake of protein, but once more, a professional uh, will be able to assess that and give you the best recommendations. For uh, decreased bone density, um, it's uh, also important to maintain a diversified diet, but we can think of uh, nutrients such as calcium that you can uh, find in dairy, in sardines, if you're in Portugal or if you have access to, to sardines, uh, cabbages. Um, we can also think of magnesium, really important also, uh, and present in uh, cereals, legumes, um, also dairy. Um, for bone uh, health, Vitamin D uh, is very, very important and also physical activity, but I will talk a bit more about physical activity at the end of the presentation. Um, so for changes in immunity, um, an adequate protein intake is really relevant because the immune system needs protein to maintain its functions and keep hydrated and once more a balanced diet, um, it's uh, also important. One other um, important uh, situation to account for are the secondary effects um, that um, are due to the treatments and can also seriously affect the nutritional status of the patients. And the most common are uh, anorexia, nausea, constipation or diarrhea, fatigue um, and neutropenia. It's important to note that frequently these adverse effects persist for several months even when the treatment is suspended. And so we have to be a little bit patient and be managing um, these, uh, all these effects uh, individually um, as they appear. So I leave you some suggestions regarding diarrhea because uh, uh, one of the questions was regarding alterations of the gastrointestinal uh, tract, um, mostly associated with antibiotics use. And we know that antibiotics really affect the gastrointestinal tract uh, because uh, they alter the gut microbiota composition that can influence the gastrointestinal function. Um, so it's we need to take a really personalized approach and be managing because these effects will be felt during um, the time you'll be taking the antibiotics, but we can be managing uh, these effects uh, as they come and really giving this support for your body to um, minimize um, the impact of the antibiotics um, on your um, gut. So for diarrhea, it's really important to keep hydrated, uh, include water-soluble fiber uh, uh, containing foods, uh, decrease the intake of high fiber foods because they will stimulate your intestine, um, eat small amounts of food through the day and limit the intake of foods high in fat and also in sugar. So uh, neutropenia is also another side effect, uh, very common, uh, results in a decrease in white blood cells um, as the result of some cancer treatments uh, that will influence and decrease immunity and increase the risk for infection. In this period, and I highlight that this is a transitory period, 
uh, additional hygiene and food safety precautions are recommended to reduce microorganisms that are transmitted in food and can cause illness. Uh, also, um, because there are changes in the gut lining uh, that increase the potential for higher gut permeability, leaving you more susceptible to, to develop these, these conditions. So it's really important to focus in these uh, hygiene measures more than thinking about limiting certain foods. But uh, so it's important to wash your hands thoroughly before preparing the meals, uh, protect exposed wounds, uh, correctly clean the surfaces um, and utensils uh, you'll use, and do not allow raw and uncooked foods to mix. If possible, use different chopping boards. Um, Thinking about your fridge and your freezer, it's really important to maintain a, a stable temperature. So um, I leave you here the, the optimal uh, temperatures uh, for each one of them. Uh, so never overload your fridge or freezer to avoid increasing its temperature. Uh, defrost uh, the food in the fridge and not at room temperature. Avoid free thaw cycles. When shopping, buy chilled and frozen foods last and avoid bruised fruits and vegetables or damaged packages. Also check the use dates and best before dates before using um, before uh, consuming your food uh, and follow them. But there are some times that we really need to think in avoiding some um, some foods. And it's really important to once more um, think of it like a transitory period. Um, and when neutropenia passes, you can, um, again, not don't be so worried about avoiding these uh, these foods. But to avoid um, unpasteurized, unpasteurized uh, cheeses and milk, probiotic drinks and yogurts or supplements, loose bought cereals or nuts, because we don't know um, for how long they're in the jars, um, raw or partially cooked eggs, damaged brood or bruised fruits and vegetables, smoked fish, raw or undercooked meat. So you should see if there's a little bit of blood in the middle, you should cook it a bit further. And pate and sushi should also be uh, avoided in this period. Also, I have you. Uh, I leave you some suggestions of alternatives. Uh, the jam in individual doses, it's um, really useful because usually the jams, um, when they're in uh, bigger jars, they um, easily form these molds in the top of the jar. So in individual doses, you may consume them and then uh, use another one uh, the next time. So is there the ne a need for a special diet um, in multiple myeloma? So I would say that there's the need for a healthy diet and there's a difference. Um, so some of your questions were around um, the, the need for a low sugar diet, for example, or a raw plant-based diet. For the low sugar diet, um, I, I'd say it's useful in any context because it's preferable to choose foods with good nutritional profile, giving good uh, energy sources, uh, protein, minerals, and vitamins to your body, uh, then choosing sources of empty calories. And we say sugar is an empty calorie because it gives us calories, but it doesn't give us any other nutrient. Um, for the raw plant-based diet, as we saw, there are many frequently alter alterations in the gastrointestinal tract and a raw diet um, uh, leads to a higher burden for the body to, to digest the, um, the foods and to also to extract the nutrients for, from these foods. So I don't suggest them. This doesn't mean that you can't eat raw foods. You can, but um, thinking of a whole diet, uh, um, composed of uh, raw foods, I really don't suggest that. So the dietary pattern that is, has really been studied and has been showing uh, to have uh, several benefits in uh, many contexts, and um, it's also known to improve gut health, is the Mediterranean diet. So I leave you here the representation of uh, what this uh, is, this dietary pattern. So um, it includes um, fish, meat, and eggs as important sources of 
uh, protein, fats, and other nutrients. These are re uh, also relevant sources of essential fatty acids. They be, it should be consumed in a minimum of two portions of fish and seafood, two portions of white meat, and two to four portions of eggs uh, weekly. The intake of red and processed meats should be limited to a weekly maximum of two portions and one portion respectively. So then we have cereals that are uh, excellent sources of energy, have a high content of B vitamins, are sources of fiber and minerals. They should be included in your meals, to one to two portions in each main meal. And if your gastrointestinal tract allows it, you should prefer um, whole grains. Then we have uh, dairy um, that are really good sources of protein and minerals such as calcium and vitamins. Um, they um, are part of this dietary pattern as um, uh, two portions daily. And then we have the fruits and vegetables, the well-known five a day, uh, that are really good sources of fiber, minerals, vitamins, and antioxidants. Um, we should uh, have an intake of five portions of vegetables or fruits um, daily. Uh, we have spices that are really great options to reduce salt, uh, and you can use them freely. And uh, we have nuts that are essential sources of essential fatty acids, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. And if you can, and if you like them, you should also include them in your um, uh, diet, one to two portions a day. And then we have the olive oil that should be the main source of fat. Uh, it's a good source of vitamins A, D, E, and K of monounsaturated fatty acids and has been associated with cardiovascular disease prevention. So it's also a really good option. And at the bottom of the pyramid, we have all these interesting images that represent all the activities that should also be involved in this dietary pattern. Things like sharing your meals with your family and friends, um, cooking instead of uh, choosing pre-prepared meals, um, adequate rest, um, so having enough sleep and uh, physical activity. And talking about uh, physical activity, um, it's really important, as I said um, before, because it's associated with improved quality of life. Um, patients who do regular physical activity usually report better global quality of life and reduced fatigue and disease specific side effects. Um, but besides, but uh, although these are really uh, good effects, only one in five people with multiple myeloma have um, reported previously, this was a study done in 2020, um, have reported to meet the World Health Organization physical activity guidelines. And what the studies show us is that uh, patients really want to do physical activity frequently. Hematologists have are a real uh, a bit afraid of prescribing it, but there are as we have nutritionists for nutrition, uh, there is um, also there are also professionals that study uh, physical activity and exercise uh, in this context of um, oncology dis oncologic diseases, and that will uh, be um, uh, the perfect um, team member to also integrate in your uh, care team and to to help you choose what's the best um, exercise and the physical activity you'll be it's best for you so it is safe uh, it's really important and it has several several of benefits and then we have supplements so i think this is a really uh, important and interesting uh, theme but it's a really wide theme and i think it would probably take us another workshop to get in depth into this um because as you can appreciate when we think of supplements uh, and when we say supplements we are including a wide a wide range of products such as probiotics we have phytotherapy we have vitamins and minerals um and, and so there are a lot of studies um 
And there are really interesting studies with some supplements, but there are still not yet robust conclusions that let us uh, recommend one particular supplement to everyone that has uh, one a particular condition. This being said, it doesn't mean that um, there's no room for supplementation. Um, it just means that it needs careful consideration. Um, it needs an assessment to check if the supplement is really needed and if it will bring benefits. Um, so there were some questions regarding curcumin and um, there are really, really few studies in multiple myeloma. Um, there were interesting results, but uh, I'd say that you may include the, um, the curcuma longa, the, the, the food uh, in your meals, if you like the flavor. Uh, but when we think of supplements, we are talking about high doses. And for this, we really don't have like robust results um, to like, to, to to make these recommendations, um, broad recommendations, let's say. And this was what I had to say. So um, thank you for your attention and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ines. It was, it was really, really interesting. And um, allow me, I, I noted a couple of points um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, just to highlight a couple of, of elements that you mentioned and which seems to me quite important. Um, for instance, and, and first of all, having a nutritionist as a support in the treatment path. I know this is not um, uh, so evident in every single countries because uh, in, in every single uh, hospital. So it, it may be a challenge for uh, some of our uh, uh, young myeloma patients, but if we have the capability to have that in our country, if we have that in the in 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 the hospital, very important to have support yes. from from that side as well. Um, so uh, it it it's a very important one. Um, what I noted as well is the variation in in our diets. So uh, very important and um, for sure, um, preferably Mediterranean. So um, yes. We will try to uh, to do so in northern countries. Uh, will be challenging as well, but uh, yeah. Think, but um... you have sorry, yeah. You have in the in other countries. You have so this is a pattern. It's not sure. to follow like, but you can uh, have um, to choose. You you can choose to have vegetables in your plate. You can choose to have fruit. You can choose to have nice, uh, good protein sources. And this is what is essential. Not. Uh, um so much following that really Mediterranean uh purely because uh, the countries don't don't have all the all the the foods uh for example but really make the adaptations and I believe that each country can have um a similar pattern that uh, will also have the same benefits exactly yeah. exactly um I know as well uh, calcium before or after meals uh, Yes, it was um, uh, protein for immunity. Um, I, yeah. I noted it as well. And um, maybe just uh, allow me to, to ask a question uh, on, on that one. Our immunity is still uh, under pressure, uh, but for sure now we're coming in the month, let's say October until February, which the immunity is, is uh, much more under pressure than, than the rest of the period. Um, do you recommend something specifically during this period uh, to to pass uh, to pass through um, uh, the, the, the these winter months? No, really. What what we know is that maintaining a good um, nutritional status is what gives us a good immunity. So I'd say like have good meals and uh, don't skip your protein because frequently when, especially when we have a little bit of less uh, appetite, we frequently like, at least in Portugal, it's, it's that way. We, um, we use like a soup as um, a dinner and uh, nothing else. And that's not sufficient. So you should uh, include protein sources in each of the main meals, uh, at least. So breakfast, uh, lunch, and dinner. And don't skip that. Right. And um, other, uh, the other thing is obviously uh, vitamins with fruits and vegetables as much as you can. Sure, sure. 
Good. Um, and last uh, but not least, what what I noted as as a couple of items that you mentioned um, about the supplements that we still do not have robust studies to have yeah. a clear view on on the real uh, effects on on supplements. And I'm I'm sure and. This is really a question that is coming uh, a lot uh, in, in our community. So uh, yeah, maybe we should have a specific session around uh, supplements, but uh, it's, it's important to know that, that we don't have today robust studies uh, yeah. correlated to multiple myeloma. This is, this is what uh, I, I learned today. And uh, thanks for this, uh, this feedback, uh, Ines. Yeah, I, I, I'd say that even for other more frequent um, types of cancer, there's still a lot of uh, not so robust um, studies because they're difficult to, to do. Uh, you have to have um, to control uh, several factors for the results to, to be able to be associated with the intake of that specific supplement. So they're really difficult to do. And um, obviously, for more frequent types of cancer, some um, nutrients are a bit uh, better well studied. But there's, there's, we still need a bit more uh, to to go. Great. Um, a few questions from the um, uh, participants from the audience, and uh, let's start with the question from uh, Eva. And we we were talking about uh, supplements. She had a very good question about the muscle cramps uh, because <clears throat> excuse me this is something we didn't uh, touch base uh, during the the presentation um yeah she, she said is attributed to lenalidomide so i i guess this is not really neutropena but it's more muscle cramps so do we have do you do you hear something like that and do we have something yes. that we could uh, potentially uh, propose uh muscle cramps are really really common um and to sometimes they're just a consequence of the treatment. And um, even if we, if we think of a su supplement of magnesium and we can think of that um, really assessing if there's a need, uh, we can like do blood uh, analysis to, to see if there's um, a decrease in magnesium, for example, and assess if there's a need for supplementation. But um, frequently the the doses probably needed uh, won't be uh, attainable uh, right. sometimes. But we can think of that, and it's a situation, once more, that we, we can assess individually. Um, but also hydration is really important uh, for, for cramps. And um, uh, frequently, patients don't drink enough water. And we can, uh, in this context, one and a half liters of water, that is usually what people think they, they, they need, um, it's not sufficient. So uh, especially during treatments, um, you need a higher intake of water, like two, three liters even sometimes. So you also uh, may think of that. And also movement. Uh, because if we are a lot, uh, a lot sedentary, the muscles tend to don't have this enough uh, blood um, circulating to 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 feed them. Right. So yeah, okay. these three factors are relevant. Thank you. Um, another question that we have here: um, considering negative effects of prophylactic antibiotics on the bowel. Versus positive effects, quality of life can be uh, severely affected. Is there any evidence of the benefits of the use? Of antibiotics? Yeah. Yeah, antibiotics, uh, they are prescribed uh, in certain situations. And um, as prophylactic use, I'm not really the person to, to talk about that because I'm not a doctor. So... Um, you should talk uh, with your doctor and really ask uh, because it's it's natural. It's a natural question to ask if it's really needed to be doing that antibiotic because it will impact your your uh, intestines. Uh, there's no way you'll be doing like antibiotics for a long time and won't feel the impact. We can obviously minimize the impact with some strategies, with some foods like really assessing what's because it varies also. Uh, uh, between uh, the uh, 
different persons, uh, we can have different effects with different foods, for example. And it really is necessary to do this assessment and check what are the foods we may be um, needing to exclude and what we can, what foods we can uh, choose to to substitute them with. Sure. Um, another one, uh, anonymous, so I can't give her or his name, uh, what food to avoid or to choose to help your stomach return to normal. Um, yeah, of course, we're suffering from stomach as well. So um, after this, the, the, the stem cell transplant, um, yeah, this yeah. is still a, a, a challenge. Uh, so um, yes, what we can do is, is the same thing. It's like going doing like this a really thorough questionnaire um asking uh, what is and seeing what are the foods that may be um stimulating more your stomach or like uh, being more aggressive to your stomach in this particular moment and try to to change even sometimes we can change the way they are cooked and it's enough um but it really is needed this this assessment and it's a consequence of either the, the 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 antibiotics use or even other treatments. Uh, they all will alter the um, thinking of the gut microbiota. They all will alter the gut microbiota, and be, we think of gut microbiota like staying in the gut, but will it will influence all the other parts of the gastrointestinal tract. So it will you will feel that those effects. Yeah, but they they can be managed. Sure, sure. Now I have to uh, to um, uh, thank uh, Archer for his question because I'm I'm uh, I'm considering that as very important for me as well about Coca Cola. Okay. I'm very heavy. So Archer is saying, is that possibly um, does Coca Cola um, uh, the cause can be Coca Cola the cause of of the myeloma and and what about Coca Cola having uh, myeloma today? Uh, we can think of one um, food item being responsible for any disease. We, there's, um, there's no evidence that supports that. It's like the all, um, we, we can think of an increased risk when we think of all um, habits, all of the diet, all of the physical activity. We can think of the stress, the sleep, um, all these factors may be influencing. So. Uh, thinking of Coca-Cola like the factor that increases the risk for multiple myeloma, we cannot say that. Combination of different yeah. elements, probably. What yeah. I can say is that it's not a healthy um, choice, so yeah. you should avoid it. Um, and uh, because it's either it has a lot of sugar or it doesn't have sugar and it has, it has sweeteners that are not really perfect and... Um, for uh, thinking about gut health, they're not. There's some evidence uh, showing that they they influence it. So, uh, and, and also thinking about um, um, the the palate, uh, you can think of reducing the sugar. But you, if you are consuming Coca Cola with sweeteners, you're not educating uh, your uh, tonsils to um, really enjoy other flavors. Exactly, exactly. Um, a, a very good one because we were talking about having a nutritionist in the path during the treatment. Yep. Um, and very good question was at what point in the journey uh, should we contact a nutritionist? Like after the diagnosis, uh, you should contact it because the the objective is not to feel or to minimize the impact of the disease and the treatments. And we can all, always uh, intervene later, but mm -hmm. if we intervene so sooner, it's better and we have better results. So as soon as you can. And I believe that in some countries, really, it's not part of the team care, like in the hospitals, as you said. Um, unfortunately, um, that's a reality, and but if you can and search for like a private uh, council, uh, you should do that. Yeah, good. Um, 
some of, of the patients are returning to a high intensity exercise. We don't have to forget that we're young yeah. patients. So yes. uh, after having a, a, a heavy treatment, uh, treatment we, we're getting back to, uh, to high intensity. Um, can be running, can be gym, can be uh, uh, different kind of, of sports. Are there specific uh, nutritional tips for for us going direct? To, uh, no, there are really not um, different recommendations than there is for any other person. So if you're really doing an intensive exercise, you have to adjust your needs, your protein needs, your energy needs. Um, you should be eating enough um because your needs will increase uh, if it's but if it's the regular exercise you don't need to think about that because usually the regular exercise it really is um um like balancing our sedentary time because we are so sedentary nowadays that going to the gym like one hour, three times a week really is just balancing that uh, sedentary time. It's not really uh, enough to think about um, more protein or more um, energy. But if it's high intensity, then you should adapt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. We spoke uh, to, on, on the winter periods, but... Um... Specifically, if, if a patient is going into a, a period for a risk of high infection, uh, not, not really in winter, but uh, across the, <clears throat> the treatment, if, if the patient is becoming into a, a, a risk infection, uh, infectional period, should he change the diet or, or being careful for something? So... Um... I, talk, I talked about neutropenic um, uh, periods and these are really specific and they are measurable. So your doctor can tell you you are you have a low uh, leukocyte count, a neutrophil count, and uh, you um, may have to follow those specific um, recommendations that I, I talked about. But uh, mostly you should be careful like uh, really... Uh, with the hygiene uh, of your um, uh, kitchen, of your uh, foods, uh, when you prepare them. And um, uh, essentially, don't eat undercooked um, meals. Uh, really check if the meat is really cooked well and uh, have that, that in mind. Um, but the other recommendations are also valid for these specific periods that you have a low neutrophil count. Um, besides that period, the usual um, safety precautions are, are, mm -hmm. are okay. Okay. This is also uh, something that I'm, 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 I'm hearing uh, a lot. A question about green tea. Uh, Arian uh, asked the question, what do you think about drinking, he said, a lot of green tea and of course high quality green tea so what, yeah. what's your point of view on that one uh so we don't have um uh, i think i saw one study um that really briefly talked about green tea in multiple myeloma but like it's one study and um it, it didn't include um high intake of mm -hmm. green tea so um i believe he, uh, you should moderate the intake for precaution because we don't have this um, reassurance that, and the danger is not to, to do harm uh, per se, is to be influencing the treatments you're doing, if you're doing them. Um, and because um, like we can have some supplements that are okay if you're not doing it a treatment, but if you're doing the treatment, it may be, uh, we may be, uh, uh, in the risk of uh, influencing this treatment and we don't want that either by increasing toxicities or uh, decreasing the effect we don't that want that and we can't measure really that because uh, the, we are not assessing the effect and we can't do that even if uh, assessing the effect at each time to see uh, what is doing usually we can see if the, the treatment worked or didn't work so as a precaution, I'd say uh, moderate the intake. It's better. 
uh, because we don't really have these robust, uh, yeah, sure. if any, <laughs> in yeah. multiple myeloma, yeah. if any. Yeah. yeah. And also in terms of, of kidney, uh, kidney functions, it doesn't have any impact on, on, on the kidney or do you have tips for proper kidney functions, uh, something that can help the uh, next to water, of course, but yeah. Um, yeah, water and uh, really assess if uh, there's a need to uh, moderate the protein intake. If there is a, an alteration, a significant alteration in the kidney function, uh, the protein intake should be reduced, uh, but only in these situations. And uh, reducing the salt is uh, really important also. And always physical activity um, and uh, balanced diet. Protein is also important, but if you don't have to moderate it, you should have a, a adequate intake, yeah. Of course. We saw the correlation with um, uh, internal fat and, 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 and the risk factor of it. Um, so how about glucose levels and in, in insulin resistance? um is it does it make sense to monitor the glucose and and uh, and to check what foods um spike it yeah i'd say if you reduce the intake of sugar as a principle you don't need and this is part of um um a good healthy diet you don't need to have this special attention to the, um, the glucose um, uh, levels uh, because typically uh, of course if you're a person that eats a lot of pasta and you may have these increases or these peaks of glucose um, but if you eat a diversified diet like you should think about having at least half of your plate with, leg with uh, vegetables and the other half like one quarter with protein and the other quarter with starch and and if you follow this it's a bit it's not very probable at at least uh, uh, if you have a regular and you don't have an alteration in your glycemic um, profile um, to have all these spikes yeah. um, and so I don't need I don't feel the need to recommend like uh, in general this um, this attention to this but in some particular cases it may be useful um, we we would have to check that yeah definitely you touch base the the point of curcumin specifically in in, yeah. in your in your presentation uh, about supplements that there's no uh, no specific study on that one uh, because we we have again some some question about that um, yeah. but what what about curcumin and and maybe protein shakes after a workout for the the the, the patients who are getting into heavy sport and 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 okay. and doing uh, so the proteins shakes are as well something that is uh, used after uh, after the sport and what do you yeah. think about that? I don't. Um, there are two uh, and can be used uh, if there's the need to. So if yep. you have high protein needs and if you're not able to have these large meals to go uh, to, to, to have this intake of protein with food, we can, there's no, I, I don't see a problem to use uh, these protein uh, powders to, to supplement uh, the, the, um, your diet. Um, but if you can choose and eat your protein with the meals, yeah, it's preferable, sure. always sure. preferable. Yeah, sure. because as we want it or not, that's a processed um, um, food. The the powder it has, it's not. Uh, so it's better if we choose um, regular foods. Yeah, I mean, there's no problem. Yeah, maybe if if I can add a comment on that one because I I asked the question uh, as well. It's important to have very good quality of 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 products. Yeah. So because yeah. We don't really know every time from where are the products yes, coming yes, from. Yes. So it's really important if we're getting into powders and and supplements that 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 we have very good quality of of products, ensuring that these protein are coming from 
from really good sources. Uh, exactly. Sure. Exactly. And so, one other thing is that these powders usually have sweeteners and other additives to give them a good flavor. And I, what I usually recommend is like choosing the ones that don't have uh, flavor. Um, um, don't have sweeteners so yeah. use fruit or use other strategies to um, like um, have a better taste for it but um, avoid these ones with especially if you're using it like daily um, avoid those ones with the, the sweeteners mm -hmm. yeah. that's a good point uh, also a, a very very good question um how can we maintain the muscle mass muscle mass during the treatment, especially during and after a stem cell transplant where we're yeah. losing quite a lot of muscle? And I think it's it's a very interesting uh, question as well. Yes, yes, yes. It, it's really relevant uh, to maintain as much as possible. So the, the way to maintain it is um, a good intake of protein and exercise. That's it. And um, obviously a balanced diet always, but what um, is important is to have the physical activity that you can have uh, and for that you should like also have this counsel uh, to choose the better one for you and the safest one for you because it's safe but not everyone can do all the physical activity it depends on even uh, each one's physical condition um, but to maintain muscle is physical activity uh, especially uh, weightlifting that not always uh, everyone likes, but it's uh, really important and protein intake. Yeah, yeah, good yeah. combination. Um, what is your view between the animal proteins and and the vegetal proteins and and the balance of of it? And um, so it seems that it's important to monitor the the animal. Uh, proteins what, what we're taking but less on I mean monitoring less the 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 um, the uh, um, plant proteins mm -hmm. what there's what do no, you think about lentils beans for instance yeah Please. there no need there's no need for um, monitoring the uh, animal protein sources what we should decrease is the uh, red meat and the processed meats, but the lean meats, the, the um, poultry chicken, um, the fish, the eggs, they're okay. Um, but the, the vegetable proteins are also okay. We just have to consider that they're not so well absorbed by the organism. They're a little bit, a little bit heavier for some pers some people to to digest them, uh, but there are also some strategies to 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 have a better digestion of those mm -hmm. foods, and as sometimes we have to complement the the legumes with um, cereals to make them complete proteins because they don't have all the amino acids that the uh, uh, animal protein has. So yeah. if we have this into consideration, it's okay. And once more, you can have like a nutritionist, a dietitian to help sure. you, uh, sure. but they're okay. Yeah. Do, do you have a, 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 um, a tip on kind of vitamins that myeloma patients should take as a supplement? As a general recommendation, uh, no, because we have to assess individually what is okay. the particular need of each one. We don't have all the same metabolisms. We don't all react the same way to the treatments. We are not all doing the same treatments. Uh, so um, we really have to assess if there's a need. What's the dose? Even when we think of supplementing one particular supplement, um, we have some, we can have some, for example, genetic polymorphisms that may influence the way we respond to that supplementation. So I cannot tell you like supplement 2000 unities of vitamin D for you and for everyone else that it doesn't work that way. We have to assess. Uh, sometimes there's the need, especially if we are eating a bit less than we, uh, what are our needs um uh, our uh, request um, we can do uh, 
lab um, uh, blood uh, exams to check the levels and with that adjust the, the doses and what are the nutrients that are um, ideally to, to supplement. Because we don't want to, to take the risk of supplementing too much and that is not beneficial also. So there's a balance. Yeah. You, you talk about having in, in half vegetables during during a uh, yeah <laughs> uh, do you have a, a good a balance between protein fat carb ratio uh if, if if we have to to prepare a meal what 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 should you recommend so the usual recommendations are around but once more it depends imagine if you're during treatment if you're losing weight if you're gaining weight the needs may differ a bit. We may uh, need to adjust them, but usually like 15, 20% of protein, 50% of carbohydrates and like around 30% of um, fat. That's the general recommendation, but they may be the need to, to adjust a bit depending on the situation. Sure. I see that we're getting almost there at the end of the uh, of okay. the session. Um, uh, a warm thank you, Ines, for uh, You're welcome your presentation and and uh, uh, all the uh, answers on the on the questions. We had a couple of, I should say, a lot of questions, and and thank you right. to the attendees as well to to ask question. And uh, it proves that the topic is is very interesting yes. and very important for us all. So again. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ines. You're welcome. Um, and to all attendees, talk to you uh, very, uh, very soon for the next uh, for the next uh, webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a nice evening, Ines. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.